Hello, my name is Brian Joseph Lee. I am the director of Public Forum and welcome back to Creative Activism, a day of art, ideas, and action. Up next, uh, we know that the 2020 election will be hard fought and divisive, but with the threat of disinformation, falsehoods, and outright lies coming from political actors, how can we cut through the noise to mobilize our vote? We are thrilled to partner with the Brennan Center for Justice, a nonpartisan law and policy institute based at NYU School of Law, as they help share the top nine dirty tricks that could undermine the 2020 election. Here are Mirna Perez, Sean Morales Doyle, Liz Howard, and our host, journalist Angelique Rocher. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, that was an incredible introduction. My name is Angelique Roche. Uh, and as Brian mentioned, I am a journalist uh, and a former political hack, I guess is what they call it uh, in its less favorable terms. And I'm really excited to welcome you to Dirty Tricks, Nine Falsehoods That Can Undermine the 2020 Election. Um, so for those of you who are paying attention, uh, we are less than six weeks away from the 2020 presidential election, an uh, election that will not only determine who is the president, but for many federal, state, local elected officials, constitutional amendments, ballot measures, and so many other key um, things that influence our daily lives. And so um, I would be putting it lightly to say that this election comes with its own unique challenges, promising to be a hard fought and politically divisive uh, election, uh, more than it has been in the past. Uh, while the co current COVID-19 pandemic has already caused some very major disruptions to our election system, it is not the only variable impacting our elections. Natural disasters, aging voting machines, foreign interference threaten to further disrupt this election in 2020. But with those very real risks, there's also a significant risk, risk that political actors will manufacture crises to undermine election results that aren't in their favor and try to undermine the electoral process itself as they have done many, many times in the past. These fake crises determine so much about how we look at our electoral process. Um, it undercuts the trust in the election outcomes, but it also inflames partisan tensions and it continues to destabilize our democracy. Today, I am joined by an incredible panel of experts from the Brennan Center for Justice, and they, uh, hopefully, as we can navigate through this hour, we'll talk about some of these falsehoods that Brian mentioned and explore the facts and discuss what it means for the upcoming 2020 election. Um, I'd like to start by asking each of you who are on the screen right now to introduce yourselves and share a little bit about your background. I know each of you have a wealth of experience, um, but just a, a short, brief introduction. And I'll also, I will start off with Nirna. Um, bienvenidos, welcome. I'm Mirna Perez. I am the director of the Voting Rights and Elections Program at the Ronan Center. Um, I am from the great state of Texas, which unfortunately is starting to be ground zero of voter suppression. I think Texas is probably going to beat states like Florida and Georgia uh, this session in terms of making it harder for people to vote. And I'm all about voters. I'm all about the right to vote. I'm all about people getting together and uh, joining with each other and uh, picking the direction of our country. And I'm uh, one of the few commentators on this who actually have a lot of faith that if Americans come together, decide we're gonna be prepared and resilient, um, we're gonna be mostly okay after the election comes. I think it's gonna take a lot of work, but I'm very, very hopeful that we still have a lot of time to make sure that the election goes smoothly. I look forward to carrying that hope through this panel. <laughs> um, next up, Liz. Hi there, I'm Liz Howard. I'm senior counsel on the election security team at Brennan. Um, I'm the former deputy commissioner of elections in Virginia and the former general counsel of Rock the Vote. Um, and I am absolutely delighted to be here today and have an opportunity to um, enlist more people um, to help us make the election that is in just 41 days even better. Awesome, and last but not least, Sean. 
Hi, I'm Sean Morales Doyle. I'm Deputy Director of the Voting Rights and Elections Program at the Brand Center. Um, I'm a labor and civil rights lawyer by trade for a, a while now, and for these last few years, been focused entirely on voting rights and elections here at the Brennan Center. Um, and like my colleagues, uh, looking forward to helping uh, helping us all make it through this election uh, with all the hope that, that Mirna started us off with. Awesome, possum. All right, so we have a long way to go. We've got nine falsehoods to hit. So let's jump right into it. Voter fraud is rampant. The claim is that there is widespread voting by ineligible individuals. What's the truth here, Sean? Uh, the truth is that there's not, uh, very simply. Um, as the slide tells you, this type of fraud is extremely rare. Um, I, I think the myth that we used to hear all the time was about, um, you know, ineligible people showing up and intentionally trying to vote in the shoes of someone else, impersonating another voter um, to vote for them. And that is extremely rare. Um, what we've heard more recently is a, a different form of this, uh, which is claims about um, mail voting being, uh, you know, uh, open to all kinds of voter fraud and people um, conducting fraud through mail voting now, and that is also extremely rare. Every study that's looked at this, including the studies by the people who have sort of made their careers on trying to prove um, what a problem voter fraud is, has shown that um, it happens in very, very, very tiny uh, set of um, cases and, is, um, and, and all of the policies that are developed to try to address this problem are really solutions in search of a problem. They're attempts um, by uh, folks who are not friends of voters to pass restrictive laws um, by using this myth of voter fraud as justification. Thank you. I mean, and I think that's such an interesting thing because you did mention like folks have really made their career off of this. And just to kind of to follow up on number two, election day should be postponed uh, because of uh, this inherent fraud and the inability to get these votes in. Like, the claim is that the president can delay election day because of the coronavirus pandemic, because that's just gonna mess everything up. Sean, I, I think you also would have a, a comment on this. Yeah, well, the first thing to know is that the president has absolutely no authority to delay the election. The president doesn't get to decide when election day is. Um, that's up to Congress. He cannot change that. He has no authority to change that. He also can't change when his term as president expires. On January 20th, if he has not won re-election, Donald Trump is out of office um, and there's nothing he can do to change that either. Um, so we don't need to worry about the president changing or postponing election day. We also don't need to worry that we can handle having an election during a pandemic. I think we have a lot of work to do and there has been a lot of work done already by elections officials to prepare for these unique circumstances. But the fact is that we've had elections through all kinds of disasters and both man-made and otherwise, including wars, um, in our nation's history, and we've gotten through all of those, and we can do it again this time. And as I said, elections officials around the country are doing what they need to do to prepare for just that. Um, and and so we don't need to worry that there's any need or reason to ch change the election day, but nor do we need to worry about the president doing it because he just can't. And I think that's an interesting point, right? Like we have had elections through pandemics. We have had elections through a civil war. Um, there have been much more drastic things happening and the country literally being in peril of existing um, and elections had happened. Um, you know, and I think that's also a very interesting thing for the next falsehood, which is non-citizens are voting in droves, um, which is something that I know has been a constant uh, thing that's been brought up. It's been uh, definitely used by political actors uh, when dealing with immigration and with dealing with who has the rights and what IDs can be used and across the board and what that looks like. And the claim is that millions of non-citizens are voting and tipping election outcomes. Mirna, um, talk to me about this a little bit. Um, there's two things that I want to point out. One is it's flat wrong. It's preposterous. The numbers don't exist. Um, the claims were getting so um, outrageous and outlandish that we actually studied it in 2016. And we found only a small number of suspected 
non-citizen voting. Um, and we compared that to the number of votes that had been tabulated in those jurisdictions, and it was literally 0.0001%. Um, but I think the part that is the most troubling and frustrating for me is just how very racialized those conversations always are. It's never people who are undocumented or it's never non-citizens. It's always highly racialized, highly offensive language that is implying that folks who are other or folks who are foreign are actually stealing the election results from legitimate Americans. Um, and that kind of racialized political commentary has really um, horrific implications in other areas of political discourse. Like we live in a time period where um, there's a lot of hate out there and there is um, an active debate we're having in this country over what it means to be a citizen and, and who matters. And I think when we have politicians at very high levels of government saying that uh, some people are here trying to steal democracy from honest Americans or implying that entire swaths of our community are um, behaving illegally and inappropriately. I think it really does a lot of damage um, to the very idea of our uh, democracy, which is one that should be robust and should be participatory and should be really inclusive, as opposed to being inflammatory, uh, inflammatory um, and hostile and unwelcoming. Well, and it's, it's, I mean, it's literally impossible to from the ground up as a person who is voting, steal an election. Um, and this has a indirect impact on a lot of folks, particularly when it comes to increased requirements. Can you talk to me a little bit of, about how that has an even deeper impact on folks be having access to the polls? Sure, all these like salacious false claims matter um, in that people, react to them, people respond to them. Sometimes people respond to them in terms of hostility against their uh, neighbor. And sometimes politicians respond to them by passing anti-voter laws that hurt everybody, but that we don't need supposedly to try and uh, keep our ballot box safe against a threat that is not existent. Um, when we put barriers in front of the ballot box, there is no question that they hit hardest those members of our community that are most on the margins, that have been most traditionally been disenfranchised, that have gotten a repeated uh, message in so many ways that they are not welcome, that they are less than American, that they don't belong here. Um, and, but those laws hurt all of us um, because they bedraggle our democracy, because they cheapen our democracy, because they turn our democracy into a political football that politicians use to try and give themselves a job security plan. And so um, we can't be conned into this. We can't um, believe these lies. We need to be very, very clear um, in saying both that uh, Americans are welcome and it doesn't matter what your community or your country of origin is or what language you speak. If you meet the eligibility uh, requirements, your vote matters just as much as everybody else, but also that we as a country need that vote. Like we are reckoning in our country. We're facing a reckoning for things that we have done and things that we have left undone and ways in which our institutions of power do not represent or reflect us all. And if we are gonna get ourselves out of the moment that we are in, which is hundreds of years in the making, we're going to need to leverage the experience and expertise of all of our citizens. And that is not going to happen if we continue to put the barrier box, uh, barriers to the ballot box so that some members of our community aren't able to be able to express their viewpoints and to share their lived and actual uh, experiences. Thank you so much. And I actually think that's a great segue to the next falsehood, which is the machines malfunctioned. They are clearly rigged. Um, and this is, this is the claim that vote flipping by voting machines and other malfunctions such as machines failing to start, crashing or freezing are clear indications that hackers have penetrated machines or that partisans have rigged the election in favor of their preferred candidate. 
Um, while we know that voting machines are getting older and there is a need to update voting machines, that is a true statement. Liz, talk to me about uh, vote flipping and this, this particular falsehood. Well, as you suggested, um, you know, a lot of the um, voting machine fleet is, is aging. Um, and the reality is that our election infrastructure has been chronically underfunded for years. Um, we've seen many states upgrade their voting equipment over the past several years. But the reality is, you know, when you have this huge deployment of equipment, um, you're inevitably going to run into some technical glitches. Um, and again, since, many, since much of the equipment is a little bit older, there's going to be normal wear and tear that results in, um, you know, uh, machine glitches. The great thing um, is that we are going to be um, using more paper ballots across this country um, than any time in recent history. Um, all of the battleground states rely primarily on voting machines that have a paper ballot. And in the event that there are any credible allegations of hacking, um, then we can always go back to that paper record and triple check. And I love that that's, I mean, it is a something that is based in fact, but also really, really hard because there is an issue with there being adequate voting machines in communities of color and it is really compounded and been such a flipped falsehood. Um, you know, and that actually leads into our, our next one, which is um, something's fishy the results are taking too long. Um, the claim is that a failure to announce results on election night is an indication of malfeasance in the election process, which I think is also uh, an indication of our intention spans uh, as voters and what we've kind of become accustomed to. But Mirna, can you talk a little bit more about what this looks like and, and why this is such a strong falsehood when it comes to election results? Right, no, you are 100% correct that we Americans have gotten largely spoiled in getting uh, results on election night. And that was something that probably should have never happened, but we've gotten in the habit of it and uh, we would be well served by having uh, an attitude adjustment on this. And the reason that I would say is because there are some very pro-voter reasons why we might not find out on election night who won. And I'd like the opportunity to go through them. The first is that if we are letting voters have the absolute maximum time to return their ballot, which is gonna be when polls close on election night, those ballots are not gonna magically appear um, in the hands of election administrators to be opened and processed that same night. Um, if we're gonna let voters have until that time period to deliberate and to be able to turn it in and we're gonna count those ballots, then we're gonna to have to give them some time to arrive. The second reason is that we do not want voters' ballots getting, mail ballots getting rejected because of technical defects. That means we wanna give voters some information and notice before it happens that there's something wrong with their ballot and we need to give them the time to fix it. We can't just say, aha, you forgot to sign something you're out of luck, we wanna let them know and we wanna give them the opportunity to mail it in or call in or show up um, and to be able to, to convert that technical defect into a ballot that'll actually count. And if we're going to give people adequate warning that their ballot is in danger because of a defect and give them time to fix it, that also means we're not gonna find out on election night who won. And finally, if we wanna have faith and result, uh, faith and confidence in the results of the election, we need to be doing after the fact checks. We need to be covering risk limiting audits. We need to be assessing to make sure that there are no discrepancies between what the machine count said, what the paper trail said. Um, and that also is not gonna happen instantaneously. So there are a lot of reasons why voters should get more used to the idea of it being election week rather than election day. I mean, when you think about it, so many people vote early anyway, or they vote with their mail ballot earlier. It's actually always been a misnomer. It's always been a misnomer. And I think our country would be well served to be patient, to make sure um, that we're giving voters all of the opportunities to cast a ballot and that we're checking and feeling confident in our results. And I kind of want to throw this over to Sean. You mentioned a little bit earlier about mail-in ballots. Um, and I know, you know, in, 
everyone can chime into because there's also the idea of provisional ballots um, and this concept of what does it mean, particularly in this year, to make sure mail-in ballots get in on time, um, the request for mail-in ballots, the fact that you don't have to actually mail in your mail-in ballot, you can actually bring it physically in. And what does that look like and how does that shift the timing um, and shift the process here because those mail-in ballots have to be postmarked by a certain date. Yeah, so the first thing for everyone to keep in mind is that we've had mail voting in the United States for a very long time and in large portions of the country, everyone's been able to cast a vote by mail for a long time. So this isn't a new thing and we don't need to be scared of it, but I, but it is going to operate at a different scale this year because of the pandemic. There are going to be a lot more people who don't feel comfortable voting in person or are going to be voting by mail. And we've already seen that in the primaries. And there are states that have changed their rules take, to take the pandemic into account. States like New York, where I live, where um, in the past we've not been able, not everyone has had the opportunity to cast a, vote, a ballot by mail. Now we can this year. So we're going to see an influx in the number of ballots cast by mail. That's going to impact what Mirna was just talking about. We're going to see ballots arriving, a larger percentage of ballots arriving after election day, because for instance, in New York, as long as you cast your ballot by election day, put it in the mailbox by election day, it gets counted even if it arrives a week later. Um, and so that's gonna lead to some delay. And when a larger percentage of the ballots are being cast that way, you're gonna see more of a delay. The other thing that, as you say, we need to keep in mind here though, is that the rules are not the same in every state. The rules for when you have to get your ballot in by mail are not the same. The rules for who's allowed to cast a ballot by mail are not the same. The rules for whether or not you can turn it into a drop box or deliver it to the polling places are not the same. Thankfully, a lot of states have made this easier again because of the pandemic this year, but people need to know the rules in their state. They need to know that, for instance, in Florida, you've got to get that ballot in the mail in time to arrive at the elections office by election day, not postmark by election day, but you have the option to bring it to a drop box or to an early voting location to drop it off. People need to familiarize themselves with the rules where they live now and start making a plan for how they're going to vote. There's a lot of opportunities to do it, whether it's in person, by mail, and at a drop box. Um, but you need to know the rules so you can make a plan so you can ensure that your ballot gets counted. And Liz, just as to, just to top it off and to cap it off here, as we're talking about these voting machines, and we're talking about smaller counties and smaller parishes who've got, whether it's less machines or machines break down, this also impacts you know, those smaller counties and smaller parishes. Um, I'm from Louisiana, so you're gonna hear me say parishes. Um, and, and, and how that affects the results actually getting in, even if the results are like in hand. And I know Mirna, you kind of touched on it, but I think this is also impacted on, you know, ensuring that there are safe results coming in and that the results are accurate. So you heard Mary talk about why it's so important to have these procedures and Sean talk about the impact of the pandemic and the likelihood that it's going to result in a huge um, increase in absentee and mail voting this cycle. So from an administrative standpoint, um, where we are specifically in three battleground states, so uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, is that the election officials aren't even allowed to start processing the ballots that are coming in. So, you know, conducting signature verification and just confirming voter eligibility until the day of, if not maybe the day right before the election. So this is going to um, likely cause the election results in those particular states um, to be somewhat more incomplete than um, the election results you see in several other states um, across the country. And, you know, when you're talking about a small parish or a small county, um, you know, the sizes of, the, of these um, jurisdictions vary drastically. So there's about eight to 10,000 different election jurisdictions in the country. Um, you know, a, a small parish or let's say uh, perhaps Carbon County, um, Pennsylvania is, is going to have fewer than a thousand registered voters and would have to count maybe, you know, a couple hundred to several hundred absentee ballots. That's going to be um, probably perhaps doable in one day, if not two. Um, this is in comparison to many of the major metros. So Philadelphia, for instance, has approximately a million voters. And if we see 30 to 70% of those voters um, vote by mail, that is just administratively gonna take longer to get complete results. 
Um, and again, the election officials are focused on providing accurate results. They are not focused on um, uh, providing results that the press can use to, to read the tea leaves. So they're going to be focused on on doing their jobs. Um, and again, this is you know this is no different than um, in the past. We've always had provisional ballots, and election results have never been final on election night. Um, it's just this election is um, expected to be close. That is a perfect segue into our next falsehood. Thank you so much, Liz. Um, that's not what the election night predictions said. Um, the claim is that election outcomes that differ from election night projections are suspect. Uh, so Liz, I wanna, I wanna turn this back over to you because we are all so used to watching CNN and MSNBC, and for those of us who watch Fox News, Fox News, or our local news, and we're used to seeing the ticker. Right, we're used to seeing this county's in, that county's in, and especially from folks who work in this realm, like we watch it very closely. But what an anchor won't tell you is that these may not be the official or the final results. These are sometimes estimates or what is in. Um, talk to me a little bit about that because I feel like that's, based on what you just said, this is gonna be extremely important. I'm not going to pick on any individual outlets, but I think any of the ones you named would have not predicted President Trump to be the winner of the 2016 election um, prior to November 2016. Um, so we have certainly seen elections um, in the past where um, the winner that the press predicted and, and some polling predicted did not actually end up um, winning the election. So again, you know, these, these elections are, are gonna be close. And again, for all the reasons that we've talked about, um, it is more important than ever that we, um, uh, you know, and I think Sean, Sean mentioned this earlier, that we understand what the procedures are in our state. So we have appropriate expectations um, for the election results um, in your county, um, in your jurisdiction or your parish um, and in your state. So I think, I think the interesting thing that folks might be curious of, like how vastly different um, are the election requirements, laws, processes in the different states? Um, because for a lot of folks, you know, we forget that it is left up to the states to create these processes. And I'll hop back over to Liz. Well, I, and I hope that Sean and Myrna um, pipe in. Myrna, is that, I think. So why don't you get started and I'll jump in. Okay. Um, you know, they, they vary very drastically on just any number of measures. Um, you know, the type of voting machines, the type of post-election audits that they have, um, the type of uh, forms um, and whether or not the forms are available online um, to register to vote, um, you know, just pretty much um, almost every every way you can think of. Myrna? Um, the only thing that I would also say is some of them vary in terms of how many protections that they give their voters. There are definitely states that are creating a climate of being more welcoming and including more voters into the process by either having policies like uh, automatic voter registration or same day registration or allowing people in their community who have criminal convictions to be able to vote. We see some jurisdictions that are really committed to the idea of uh, voter education. Um, and we see some that uh, spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to meet their meet their voters needs. I mean, I tend to think that states uh, and jurisdictions break down to those that are uh, that subscribe to a robust and expansive view of our democracy versus those that are going to do the bare minimum of what they're required to do. Um, and I think we are all better off when more of us are participating in voting. I love it. Um, so this actually leads to another question I think is very interesting, particularly when you're talking about protecting folks, people's rights. What do you have a right uh, as a, whether you're the candidate or the voter is recounts, audits and election contests are ways to steal an election the claim is that recounts, audits, and election contests are illegitimate attempts to undo a valid election result. Um, that's not what I learned in civics, but I'm gonna throw it over <laughs> to the experts. Um, Liz, talk to me, one, talk to folks about what recounts, audits, and election contests are, 
um, because uh, they are they are definitely an, an a different level than it's casting your vote. It's it's that that next statement, and a lot of folks I don't think understand one what they are, and two who can actually make the like trigger these mechanisms. So a little bit, it's going to vary state by state, but a, but a general broad overview is a recount is, is basically just what it sounds like. Um, we, um, election officials and a mix of candidates and, and other interested parties will go in um, and actually recount the ballots that were cast. Um, and so separately, um, there is a, a procedure called a post-election audit, which again is going to vary a little bit state by state. But an audit is where you go in and you take a sample of the ballots cast. Um, and then you compare that sample to the total results and you do an analysis um, to basically check the accuracy of, of the outcome, check the accuracy of the voting machine. So, so a very important piece um, and absolutely one of kind of the three foundational um, measures in, in election security that, that we support. Um, and then a contest is gonna vary a lot by state. Um, it is often where, um, um, a party feels that the election result is just absolutely wrong. Um, sometimes they don't have the option to request a recount and, and perhaps a contest is the only option, but basically they're post-election dispute mechanisms um, that may provide some opportunity to go back and, and look at um, the election results. And these are normal parts of um, election cycles. You know, I, again, was an election official in Virginia. We, um, you know, had recounts uh, all the time. <laughs> we had we had a recount that actually determined control of the state legislature. I think it was in 2017. We had a recount um, that can term that determined the attorney general's race back in 2014. Um, you know, these are procedures that where you go back in and you again just look at the votes that were cast and you work with um, both uh, different parties and different candidates and you come up with the procedures to, to do this. So, um, you know, efforts to um, uh, to suggest that these are illegitimate are um, merely efforts really um, to uh, have decrease voter confidence, um, not just in the elections, but in, but in our democracy. Which is interesting because I, I know this sounds drastic and everyone says this, but this sometimes comes down to a handful of votes, correct? Every vote counts. Um, the election that I referenced that determined control of the state house in Virginia came down to one vote. Wow. Um, and I think it's very interesting because all of us hear this word recount and we think about the movie recount and Supreme Court cases and all these different things. But this is really something that happens on a regular basis in municipalities, on state levels, within legislative races. Um, it happens all the time as a form of relief to go through and really check. And at this point, like what is, how are folks fighting against this uh, when it comes to like making it illegitimate. Like you can't really go in and say, oh, don't do a recount, but it does really change public opinion, correct? It can. Um, and I think as a general rule, um, all of these procedures are conducted in a very transparent manner by the election officials. Um, you've seen them engage in just, you know, it, it, like very um, innovative ways, even in the middle of a pandemic, even in the middle of social distancing recommendations to enable um, their voters and their constituency to have um, a bird's eye view of what's going on. We've seen multiple um, election officials install video cameras um, in their offices. So um, voters, again, and the public can log in and, and watch as the election officials are counting the ballots or tabulating them um, and or conducting the audit. So, um, you know, this is, it's, it's um, the pandemic has presented some challenges, but as, as, as a general rule, the, the um, transparency is built into this and provides many opportunities for voters to have their questions answered. And I absolutely encourage everyone that has any question to reach out and talk to their local election official um, and, and walk, you know, ask them to walk through the various security measures that they are taking to keep their election um, secure and to make sure that uh, their voters vote counts as cast. Wow. Well, okay. So as we're talking about votes being cast, um, I want to talk about assisted voting for this next falsehood. People 
can't help people vote. So the claim is that groups that help many voters cast their absentee ballots are engaged in illegal ballot harvesting and laws that allow such assistance enable election fraud. Okay, Sean, break down what ballot harvesting is, um, why it is illegal and what actually people are doing when they're assisting people who really do need assistance um, to cast uh, a legitimate ballot? Well, I think ballot harvesting is a term that's sort of used to conflate a couple things together in order to make a claim that, again, is a myth. Um, and, and what's happening is, is when folks talk about ballot harvesting and attempt to suggest that someone helping another person cast their ballot is indicative of some sort of malfeasance or, or um, something nefarious going on, um, they're, they're conflating the idea of ballot collection and assistance in collecting and, and turning in ballots with ballot tampering, which of course is illegal. Um, ballot collection, helping someone turn in their ballot, absentee ballot is legal in most states. Um, in most states, you could have certain people, whether it be a legal guardian or a caretaker, uh, turn your ballot in for you if you need assistance. In some states, the group of people who can do that for you is broader. Um, but there's no correlation between the states that allow a broader type of ballot collection and assistance in that regard um, and, and the places where we've seen ballot tampering take place. Now, there's there have been some recent scandals of ballot tampering where political actors campaigns have done bad things collecting you know taking people's ballots and and messing with them or destroying them or that kind of thing that is obviously illegal everywhere and it is also caught and prosecuted and that's why we very rarely hear about these scandals but when we do it's because someone's getting in a whole lot of trouble for it um, we have laws against this and they don't have anything to do with um, whether or not a state allows people to help others vote. As I said, most states do, and the states that allow more of that have no more prevalence uh, of these sort of ballot tampering crimes uh, taking place. So I wanna, I love that folks are getting very equipped with knowledge. I wanna give a couple of examples of what is voter assistance, right? Like when does this kind of, and I know it's very, it's different again, state by state, who can and when and how, um, but can you give us a couple of examples just to kind of nail in how important voter assistance sure. can be for folks? Yeah, I mean, so as I said, in some states, the group of people who can turn in a ballot for someone else can be quite broad. Um, it could be that I turn in the ballot for everyone in my household. I turn in my wife's ballot and um, my mom's ballot. But in, or it could be that I, you know, that there are sort of, broader collection efforts than that. But in order to give it, people an idea of why these laws exist, it's perhaps better to point to the cases that are legal in, in basically every state or most states, I should say. And that's, for instance, you know, your elderly grandmother who can't um, cast her ballot herself. And so her caretaker or a family member or a legal guardian can, um, can collect the ballot for her and turn it in. I think that's something that we should all want and that's why it's legal. Um, it, it's it, it, someone who has a disability that's preventing them from casting their ballot. Um, there are all kinds of reasons why we don't want those kinds of limitations that people have to prevent them from participating in, in our elections. And so that's why states allow people to do this kind of thing. Um, but some states have you know, relaxed the rules a little bit more than that to allow um, it, it, even broader collection of people to turn in ballots because we can't necessarily say sitting here today all of the many reasons why you might need assistance in turning your ballot or and, and we want to make it um, we want to facilitate and make it easy for people to cast ballots and to vote and that's particularly the case right now when there are all kinds of new obstacles to people getting the ballot turned in during a pandemic and the important thing to remember is that the states that are allowing that broader group of people to help make sure everyone gets a chance to vote we're not seeing, there's no evidence that that is somehow causing any kind of additional crime or problems or that the mere fact that someone is helping their fellow citizen cast their ballot somehow suggests that something nefarious is going around. It's kind of a crazy thing to suggest, in fact, right? Like that, that just the fact that I'm helping someone who needs help cast their, casting their ballot to cast it, that I am, you know, that 
that we should all be suspicious of that. Um, that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, it's good to help people vote uh, and to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to participate. And I'm, I assume that that's going to be extremely important, particularly when we're dealing with folks who may have um, at risk condition, be at higher risk for COVID or may be in quarantine because they are being safe and, 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 and taking care of their fellow human and ensuring that they're not getting other folks sick or whatever the cause is, particularly if they've been traveling and have to be in quarantine. Like I'm right. sure there's dozens of new reasons uh, for, in 2020. To make it a little more personal, I recently uh, moved back to New York from out of state after being uh, gone for a little while and was coming from um, my in-laws home in Illinois. And so I had to self quarantine when I got to New York because the rates are higher in, in Illinois than they are in New York. Um, it is, that, as we've already talked about, it might be that I'm coming down to the wire in terms of mailing in my ballot and getting it turned in in order for it to be counted. If I'm in a situation where I don't wanna leave my home or shouldn't leave my home, or where we don't wanna have six people from my home all go to the polling place to drop off our ballots to make sure our ballots are counted, it's in everybody's best interest to let one person uh, collect those ballots and bring them in and drop them off in the drop box. Um, in order to avoid breaking quarantine, in order to make sure they get in on time, and in, avoid to, in order to avoid the, um, the crowding at the polls that would be, that's never good, but that can be particularly dangerous during a pandemic. Yeah. And so, I mean, one of the things that I wanted to say is also that I think there's something really messed up about the fact that uh, assisting a voter try and cast a ballot that is reflective and consistent with what their hopes and dreams for the country is, is getting, gets conflated with people perpetrating fraud upon voters, with people stealing their votes, with people tampering their votes. And we see laws uh, that target one and act like it's the same thing as something else. Like one of them is giving voice and assisting someone effectuate their vote the other one is corroding it and corrupting it and, 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 and denying somebody an actual say. And, and I think that the idea that people would be so self-serving and so um, just cynical and so manipulative to try and treat both of those things as the same thing, justifying the same response is a, is a, a problem in our democracy that we need to face and that we need to call out. We need to call out the voters that are trying to treat um, those two instances as the same because they're not. They're two different ills. They're two different victims. Um, and um, we need to not give them a pass when they try and do things like that. And I think that goes for our last falsehood as well, which is we need more aggressive purges to clear out all of the ineligible voters. The claim is that aggressive voters per the aggressive voter purges are needed because voter rolls are infected with large numbers of ineligible voters. I'm going to go back to you first, Mirna, but I think everyone's got a uh, a, a little bit to add to this. So uh, everybody in this country is better off when our rolls are clean and accurate. Right there, we're better off when we know who is supposed to be voting and who lives where and who is eligible and what polling places they should go to. We all benefit from election administrators not having to spend more money printing out poll books or sending out mail ballots. Um, that is not in dispute. What has turned into a ridiculous political debate is how much risk are we willing to take in the hopes of achieving perfectly clean rolls that we're gonna throw eligible people off the rolls. Because if you have been purged, there's a good chance that you're not gonna find out till you show up at election day. And I gotta tell you, there's not a whole lot that can be done for you when that happens. Um, and so what we need is sensible, thoughtful, deliberative, processes that have not been overly politicized, that are not uh, haphazard, that are not called because you have some crazy attorney general claiming that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of non-citizens on the rolls. 
Um, we need very sober database analysis about uh, what changes we need to make in order to make sure that our roles are as clean as possible, recognizing the very big gravity that comes from us getting it wrong. And so unfortunately, we're in a mode where we are seeing a lot of anti-voter groups actually suing election administrators because they are not purging aggressively enough, um, which I think really goes to this idea of two Americas. You have half of America that is terribly worried that they're going to be illegitimately purged. And then you have these political activists that are trying to purge people more, so much so that they're actually hauling election administrators into court. Um, we do have good guardrails. Um, the federal laws, the motor voter law, which the technical term is the National Voter Registration Act, sets, certain for, sets forth certain protocols that if states follow, strike a, a strike a balance between getting our rolls perfectly pristine and between making sure that eligible voters aren't thrown off. And instead of trying to sneak in ways to purge outside of the NVRA, we need to be thoughtful about enforcing it, which means not only the parts of the, N the NVRA or motor voter that get more people on the rolls um, and the parts of it that um, add transparency and the parts of it that make sure that more people are brought into our system, those are the parts that we need to be focusing on at least as much as we're focusing on those provisions that get people off the rolls. And certainly if we're gonna be getting people off the rolls, we must give them all of the protections they are entitled to under law. And I think it's interesting and I'm sure folks who are watching, some might be quite surprised that you don't get a notification. Sometimes you do not find out if you've been purged or sometimes you've been sent a notification that doesn't seem like a notification if you don't respond. Like, there's a lot of different methods that have been used here at the end of the day, and I'll, I'll open this up to you, Sean or Liz, like how does this impact the voters themselves? Obviously they get to the polls and they can't cast a ballot, but this seems like a little bit of a deterrent for folks in, in believing that they can, they have the right to vote um, if they could just be washed out of the polls. Yeah, so I will say they should get notice. Uh, unfortunately, it, it's, it is a violation of the law when they are not given notice. Unfortunately, it has happened. Um, and, um, and there have been lawsuits and enforcement actions as a result of that. But, uh, but sometimes people don't get notice. Sometimes they don't realize they got notice, so they don't realize what, what, what that notice means for them and what they need to do about it. Um, and the fact is, as Myrna said, the way this often plays out is that someone shows up to vote on election day and they get there to cast their ballot and they don't show up on the books and they don't know why and they can't figure it out. And they might cast a provisional ballot, but that's not necessarily gonna get counted. In many instances, it won't get counted. Um, the, the, there are a couple of ways of dealing with that, the, of, with this problem, I should say. The first is, as Myrna said, not to have these, um, often illegal and overly aggressive purge practices in effect in the first place to knock people off the rolls inappropriately. And the second is along with that to make sure that everyone gets all of the notice and protections that they're entitled to before they're removed from the rolls. The third is to put po good policies on the books. Mirna already referenced automatic voter registration. Same day election day registration is another one to make sure that if someone does find themselves in that unfortunate situation of showing up to vote on election day and being told they're not on the rolls, they have the opportunity right then and there to get registered, get on the rolls and cast their ballot. And there are some states that have that policy now, but more could be doing it. Um, and it would really help prevent this, uh, this terrible situation. The important thing for voters to do is to check their registration, to do it now. We're heading into an election. You want to make sure you're on the rolls. You want to make sure you're registered at your current address. And, uh, and you need to do that. In some states, the, the deadline for registering is coming up in the next couple of weeks. For the November election, so people should be doing that now to make sure that they um, that they're not going to face this really unfortunate situation. Awesome. Well, I I oh please, Liz. Yes. Well, I was just going to add on. You know, like Sean said, please. Um, I hope everyone gets um, to check their voter registration right now. Make sure that it's current and up to date. And just from an election official standpoint, so there there are absolutely bad actors in this space, and they've been just nakedly partisan. Um, efforts to disenfranchise voters. But um, list maintenance, quality list maintenance and compliance with these, um, you know, uh, 
guardrails that that are you know pretty pretty simple um, is not free. It is um, it costs money. And again, to the extent that um, our election infrastructure and our election officials have been just chronically underfunded, this is another reason why we need to invest. Um, in, in our democracy and specifically, right, in these offices and, and the technology and the infrastructure to do this well. Well, I wanna thank all of you so much for all of your fantastic insight. This was absolutely amazing. I have one final question. Um, if you could paint a picture of an all-inclusive, um, not as um, sporadically spaced out um, protected system where every American has the right to vote, what would it look like? I'm gonna go to Myrna first. Um, I would say it is one in which every eligible American uh, is registered vote and participating um, and one in which we reduce if not eliminate those laws disenfranchising people because of criminal convictions. Sean? Yeah, I think I wanna harken back to something um, Mirna said early on, um, but it bears repeating. All of these myths that we're talking about today um, so many of them are, are designed to disenfranchise certain people. Um, they're desi designed to accomplish racist objectives and to stop people, um, Black people, Latino people, people of color from voting. Um, and they're also designed to play to people's fears in precisely that way, right? That the references to the infected voter, voter rolls or to um, you know, non-citizens voting, they're, they're all, you know, playing to people's xenophobia and fears of the other and fears of someone coming to invade their democracy or whatever. Um, they're, so they're designed to play to people's fears in order to justify policies that accomplish exactly that thing. So if I'm looking at the sort of ideal democracy, it looks exactly like Marina said, but in order to get there, it means getting rid of all of this nasty rhetoric, these myths, and the clear intentions of some to, to stop, not just to stop voting and to reduce voting, and there's certainly a name to do that, but to target it at certain communities, we need to come to terms with the fact that that has been the history of our country since its founding. And we need to get into a place where we're not thinking about how someone, we think someone is going to vote when we decide whether or not they have the right to vote, we're not thinking about whether or not someone looks like us or comes from the same place as us when we're thinking about how to design our democracy. We're just trying to do it in a way that will ensure every single person has the opportunity and will actually cast a ballot. Liz? I would just say that it would be a system where it's easy for everyone um, that wants to participate to do so, whatever that means for them. I love it. Um, and and I, I know this year that a lot of folks are going to be looking at all of the options we've talked about on this panel, whether it's early vote, mail in, in person. Um, and I know that there's always this uh, absentee versus mail in, um, depending on which state and depending on the requirements. And for you, just to kind of close up, if folks want to learn any more information, uh, I know we mentioned about folks checking their voter registration. We know, we know, we mentioned folks going to go see what the requirements are. If any of you want to drop any great resources before we close up the panel for folks to follow up and get more information, particularly about their state, their county or parish, about how they can utilize a lot of these mechanisms, that would be great. I'll just say the Brennan, we have on our website, uh, a, a, a website, a, a page about preparing your state for an election and pandemic that lists where all 50 states and DC are on so many of the policies that are relevant to voting during a pandemic. We also have a set of toolkits uh, for activists in all 50 states and DC, uh, what needs to be done still and how you can talk to your local elections officials about getting the things that are left to be done done. So I would commend everybody to go take a look at those. But we also have resources on basically all of the myths that we talked about today about how voter fraud is not rampant about, um, you know, every single thing we talked about today. And so, you know, just get on our website and look around and, and find, uh, find out more there. 
I think that was absolutely perfect. And I, I have checked out some of those resources. They're pretty amazing. I've been using the Britain Center for years. So thank you so much for all of the work that you do. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much to the Public Theater and the Public Forum for hosting this. Um, and, you know, please vote. <laughs> vote. Thank you. Wow. Thank you to Angelique, to Sean, Liz, Myrna, and our friends at the Brennan Center for all of their expertise. And uh, like Sean said, if you want to learn more about defending our elections, voter security, fair representation, if you need resources in all 50 states and DC, go to brennancenter.org for more information. So up next, creative activism continues with a conversation between scholar and author P. Carl and noted playwright and poet Claudia Rankin. Stay tuned. <laughs> 